So in this video, I'm gonna review what happens at a synapse. We're gonna to try to review two things, the actual molecular events that occur, how the information is actually passed from one neuron to the next, and then I'm gonna to try to broaden that into a bigger picture and kind of get you to see how that might represent the, the processing of information that takes place in your brain every second. So uh, we're talking about, again, the junction where one neuron's axon maybe meets the next neuron's dendrites, typically. Um, this might be, for example, a sensory neuron reporting to an interneuron in your brain. As we'll see, there are actually multiple layers of interneurons, so maybe interneurons talking to the next layer of interneurons. But there's always a one-way flow of information. And what we're really going to be doing is zooming in for our next slide on what this might look like. So in this picture, we've got the first neuron, or called the presynaptic neuron here. Maybe this is the next neuron, or the postsynaptic neuron. And then we've got the little bit of gap in between that we call the synaptic cleft. So we're again trying to think about how the information is passed from one neuron to another. It's going to start with the electrical action potential that I talked about in video two. So remember that that was still traveling down the axon of the first neuron. So it's still coming down as sodium travels in and potassium then goes out of the neuron. And remember that the movement of those two ions represents an electrical current. So as it turns out, that electricity itself is going to trigger the next event, which is broadly that the vesicles will sort of untether from the cytoskeleton that holds them in place, and that allows the vesicles to fuse with the cell membrane and release the chemical neurotransmitter that's inside to the synaptic cleft. A little bit more detail, though I don't need you to worry about this, the action potential itself actually causes voltage-gated calcium channels to open, and that calcium will diffuse in and bind to that protein that kind of holds the, the vesicle in place and changes its shape to enable the vesicle to escape. And so now the neurotransmitter is in the synaptic cleft, and what it will do is very quickly diffuse over to some ligand-gated ion channels in the next neuron the postsynaptic neuron, and by binding at those ion channels, it changes the shape of those proteins so that they open, and that's going to allow uh, whatever ion those channels let diffuse go in or out, at least until the neurotransmitter falls off, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Now, which ions might flow kind of depends on which type of neurotransmitter uh, the chemical is. As it turns out, there are sort of maybe two broad categories. There are excitatory neurotransmitters who are trying to get the next neuron to fire an action potential. And so maybe that neurotransmitter would be uh, targeting ligand-gated sodium channels because, as I said in video two, if you have enough of those channels open and you get enough sodium diffusing in, then you might trigger those voltage-gated sodium channels to open, and then you're definitely firing an action potential. A uh, quick example, though you don't have to memorize neurotransmitters, but glutamate is, is, is almost always an excitatory neurotransmitter. Um, there are also inhibitory neurotransmitters, though, and actually what they're trying to do is prevent the next, uh, uh, prevent the next neuron from firing an action potential. And so typically they will uh, open up either ligand-gated potassium or even chloride channels. Both of those ion movements are going to cause the next neuron inside to become more negative, and that makes it less likely to fire an action potential. And so a quick example of that is GABA, uh, and you don't need to know, worry about what that stands for. Okay, so whatever neurotransmitter is released by that first neuron is um, in the synaptic cleft, maybe affecting the next neuron in some kind of way, but that signal doesn't stay in the synaptic cleft forever. Eventually, there are some pumps in the first neuron that might uh, force the uh, neurotransmitter chemical back in, recycle it back into vesicles, and so uh, the signal is over, and potentially we can repeat the whole process. So we've converted what was initially an electrical signal into a chemical signal, and that might affect the electrical behavior again within the next neuron. Okay, so we've at least covered the broad events. Now let's just try to put this a little bit into a bigger picture. Um, why does this represent the brain processing information? 
And so if I zoom in even further, what I'm really trying to argue is that the next neuron is really making a little uh, molecular decision. It's essentially making the decision not to fire its own action potential or perhaps fire an action potential down its own axon to perhaps the next neuron at the next synapse. And so that's a zero or one decision. And remember that that's really the basis of things like computer coding to also process information. So this is where information is really processed in your own brain at each and every synapse as the next neuron decides essentially whether to ignore uh, the information coming into it or to perhaps send along information itself. And sometimes that can be a complicated series of decisions, but this is also why we convert the electrical signal into a chemical signal is because you can sort of add up chemicals. So maybe the first neuron is firing, but firing at a very low frequency, so it doesn't release very much neurotransmitter very often. And so maybe it is firing excitatory neurotransmitter, but it's at such a low concentration, that chemical, that the next neuron doesn't fire, so it ignores the information. However, if the uh, first neuron were to fire instead at a very high frequency, then perhaps it would be releasing neurotransmitter a lot, and that would cause for there to be a lot more neurotransmitter in the cleft, and that might stimulate enough activity in the next neuron that maybe the next neuron does fire, and so it decides to pass on the information. This gets even trickier because sometimes there are multiple presynaptic neurons who might be releasing neurotransmitter. And so another way to get enough excitatory neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft is for these two neurons to maybe fire at the same time so that they both release neurotransmitter and only then does the next neuron fire. Sometimes uh, there are multiple presynaptic neurons coming into the cleft and they, one of them might even be releasing inhibitory neurotransmitter. So sometimes you get these complicated interactions where uh, they sort of cancel each other out and the next neuron doesn't fire. And so there's just an extremely complex series of interactions that occur between neurons and by converting the signal into a chemical signal we can kind of add all of their inputs together and make a decision. And so if we were to kind of think about all of the neurons involved in some kind of overall information processing system, we might see kind of multiple layers of neurons talking to other neurons. Uh, for example, your own visual processing system in your brain, a specific region of your brain, um, has many, many, many layers of inner neurons talking to other inner neurons as they are processing all the visual information you're seeing because visual information is very complex. You've got different colors, different shapes, different shades of light, um, different angles, uh, different distances, and all of that leads you to kind of uh, process and ultimately decide what you're seeing. And just to give you a sense that this isn't just some kind of theoretical concept, there are actually engineers building artificial neural networks that kind of use the same principle to get very sophisticated programs to do complex tasks, like recognize some kind of visual image for what it is. And so you have um, some kind of sensory system, and then you've got uh, these, these neuron-like objects reporting the information to layers of essentially interneurons, and these next layer objects get to decide how they pass the information on, and that ultimately decides how the image is processed. And so there's artificial ways to kind of use the same kind of, of neural architecture that your brain uses. Your brain's even more interesting though because you've got all of these different processing centers in different parts of your brain all working at the same time, right? You're not only watching a visual image right now, you're also listening to me and making sense of what I'm saying. Well, you've got auditory neurons sending their axons to a different part of your brain and you've got all kinds of different synapses processing that auditory information while at the same time you're watching me. So it's all very complex. Um, for this introductory course, I really just wanna make sure you know the basic events of what happens at a synapse. Uh, 
And again, I really want you to see how this is an example of information flow, an electrical signal in one initial neuron, and how that information is passed as a chemical neurotransmitter that might change the electrical firing pattern of the next neuron.